Welcome everybody. We're going to talk about chapter five, the public goods and externalities as well as tax incidents. So here we go. All right, now market failures exist when for whatever reason we do not produce the right amount of the product. So resources can either be over allocated or under allocated, meaning we can either make too much or not enough stuff. It's a demand side failure when a situation occurs where we can't charge consumers what they're willing to pay. That means that some people will enjoy the benefits without paying. So the example here is a fireworks display. Okay, so on 4th of July, there's no way for me to blow off the fireworks in my backyard and stop my neighbor from seeing it. Okay, what that means, even though the, my fireworks display is really cool and my neighbor would be willing to pay it, how am I going to walk across to all the people who could see it and say, all right, now throw money into a hat? It just isn't going to work very well. Now, the fact that people are willing to pay, but there's no mechanism by which I can charge them, means that we have a demand side failure. Okay, the opposite side of that is a supply side failure. This happens when the firm does not pay the full cost of producing its output. So the example here is often uh, dumping waste in a river. So if I can just take the waste that my business produces and I can toss it in the river, that is way cheaper for me to get rid of my waste than to pay for it to be done correctly. Problematically, though, this means that somebody else is going to have to pay the cost, right? So there's, you know, maybe the fish are going to die and then the fishermen are going to pay the cost. Or maybe uh, it's going to make people sick who drink the water. So then they're going to pay the cost, not the people who are supposed to. What that's going to then do is make sure that our demand curve, in the case of a demand side failure, does not reflect full willingness to pay, or our supply curve doesn't reflect the, all the cost of production, okay? So in an efficient market, the demand curve does reflect everything that consumers wanna pay, and the supply curve does reflect all the cost of production. Now, we've already discussed consumer surplus a little bit, but let's take a look. It's the difference between what a consumer is willing to pay for a good and what the consumer actually pays. So you can look at it as the extra benefit from paying less than the maximum price. Now we've got some examples here, and this was very similar to the auction that we ran. So 13 is what Bob is willing to pay, but he only has to pay 8, meaning he garners $5 worth of consumer surplus. Let's see what it looks like graphically. So it is going to be the area underneath the demand curve, but above the equilibrium price. So this right here is consumer surplus, this right here is P times Q, and we know that P times Q equals total revenue. So this yellow area is our total revenue square. Producer surplus, oppositely, is the difference between the actual price a producer receives and what they would be willing to accept. So it's the extra benefit they get from receiving a higher price than they're, than they're necessarily going to accept. So here's the same chart. We see that Carlos is willing to sell for $3, but he gets to sell for 8 so he has $5 of producer surplus. Graphically, we see an upsloping supply curve. And here, we have two triangles. We have the same square, so this P times Q square is still what it was, but we also have producer surplus, the area above the supply curve, above supply, and yet below P. So this right here is producer surplus. The whole box together still represents total revenue when it's this and this, okay? Now, we know that when a market is working efficiently like it's supposed to, here's our equilibrium that gives us a certain quantity and a certain price. That price quantity combination is the efficient market. That means that we are allocatively efficient. We're producing the correct amount. That gives us consumer surplus, and it gives us producer surplus, those two areas, okay? However, we sometimes have efficiency losses. So notice, instead of producing 
the efficient quantity Q1 if instead we produce Q2. So this means that we are not making as much as an efficient market would make. We're making an, an amount that is less. What we see is right here, this, this triangle right here becomes, and if, if we have numbers, so if this is three and this is six, and this is 10, then we can do 1 half base times height. Okay, so base is 10, height is 3, so that gives us 30 divided by 2 is 15. So that means that we have a $15 efficiency loss, assuming that we you know, have these kinds of numbers. Okay, so under production gives us an efficiency loss of $15. Now, instead, let's say we overproduce. We make Q3 rather than Q1. Same sort of deal. We're making too much, and that is also efficiency loss, and we can do the same thing. We can calculate uh, what the dollar value of that is by doing one-half base times height. Now let's get into tax incidence. What we're discussing here is when a tax rolls out, who really pays it? So we're going to focus on excise taxes. These are going to be taxes that get put onto stuff. And I'll tell you right off the bat that tax burden depends on elasticity. Your inelastic or your elastic demand and supply are going to tell who pays the tax. Because remember, economists don't particularly care. We want to know where the taxes go because that's going to impact things. But in terms of the price and like who pays this and who pays that, that's not really what economists pay attention to, right? Or, you know, who writes the check, I should say. Do the consumers write the check to the government for the tax or do producers write the check to the government for the tax? Economists don't care about that. And we're going to see what they do. We also are going to pay attention to the fact that there is a dead weight loss, which is what we call that efficiency loss that we just saw before. And then we're going to see some of the consumer and producer surplus transfer to the government. Okay, so that's kind of what taxes do. Let's take a look. All right, so here is our efficient market. We're talking about bottles of wine or something, bottles of something, I don't know. Uh, at We will sell 15 million bottles per month at $8 per bottle. Now let's say we put an excise tax on this. So we know that taxes are gonna be leftward shifters of supply. So that's gonna give us this little situation right here. What's happening is the tax is shifting supply to the left, which means that instead of producing 15, we're now going to produce this number here, okay? So some amount of quantity is never going to get produced at all. Now we said that it's a $2 tax. Where does this $2 tax show up? And the answer is it shows up right here. It's a $2 tax is a per unit tax. And per unit, anything is going to equal a vertical line. So we wanna keep that in mind, okay? So here, vertically, this is our $2 tax, okay? That is, that's really important. So we have $2 here, and we have a quantity here. So this area, this area right here, the whole square where the $2 tax makes the vertical portion, and then we multiply times Q, this is going to be the government's share of all the money that comes in, okay? Whoops, sorry. Here we go. So this is gonna be the government's share of all the money that comes in. Then we're gonna have this amount right here. This is the efficiency loss, okay? So, or the dead weight loss. This triangle is going to be production that doesn't happen. Because remember, we produced this lower quantity. We only produced 12, so there's three that are not getting produced at all. Okay, so this would be a portion of the former producer surplus, and this is a portion of the former consumer surplus that just doesn't happen because we're at this new equilibrium price and quantity. So the new equilibrium price is $9. However, since we know that the government is getting this $2 tax, what that means is that producers are getting $7. 
Okay, so um, so this large rectangle is sort of so what we'll call the, that the nine dollar price. Okay, so that is total revenue. Okay, that equals total revenue based on the sale. But we've also got seven times Q, and that equals really what the producers take home. Okay. The producers aren't going to take home all 9 times 12 because they got to, I mean, what maybe they take it home, it doesn't matter. They have to write a check to the government for 2 times 12. Okay, so that's going to be important. Now, the other thing is this line right here that goes through the middle that bisects the box, that is going to take, remember, our old consumer surplus. Okay, well, this portion is no longer consumer surplus. That now is becoming the government's tax revenue. And this used to be producer surplus, but now this is no longer going to the producers. That's going to the government. So now producer surplus is this area here. I'll, do, I'll make that kind of dots, okay? And then this triangle, that is consumer surplus. So this right here, this is gone. That's dead weight loss. This is all the revenue that goes to the government. This is consumer surplus. This is producer surplus. And total revenue is this whole box. The total revenue minus what the government gets is this smaller box down here. Okay. So now what we're going to see is when the tax shifts, okay, so notice we have elastic demand right here. So this is rel what we'd call relatively elastic. It's a little bit flatter. And what we're going to see is check out these boxes. So here's the same box, okay? But you'll notice that with relatively elastic demand and then what we would consider just a normal, you know, one, you've got producers paying a, ma a big burden of the tax and consumers a relatively small portion of the, of the tax burden. Which makes sense. If consumers have a strong response to a change in price, then that tax is going to really change their behavior. Meaning producers are going to have to eat more of the tax than consumers will because it's so easy for consumers to just not buy whatever is now taxed. Now let's look at it at the opposite. you got very inelastic demand. So this would be your prescription drugs. You tax prescription drugs, and because they're so necessary, so inelastic, producers pay a very small portion of the tax, and consumers pay a relatively larger portion of the tax. So this is what is answering the question, who pays the tax? It doesn't matter who writes the check. It matters who bears the burden. And the burden is going to be based upon elasticity. Okay, so here in these two examples, we have relatively inelastic demand and relatively elastic demand. Now let's take a look at supply. So here we've got relatively elastic supply with our negative one demand. And you can see with very elastic supply, producers are able to pass the majority of the tax burden onto consumers. But with relatively inelastic supply, now you see that consumers bear very little of the tax, and producers have to eat the whole thing, which is very interesting, okay? So you would hope that the government would be paying attention to all of this, keeping in mind that there are two reasons that the government uh, taxes, okay? So they tax, one, to raise revenue, right? And that revenue gets used to do all sorts of things, everything that the government does. Whether you like what they do or not, they need money to do it. The other is to change behavior. Okay, to maybe um, make people stop smoking or start eating healthy, put a tax on soda or something like that that encourages healthy eating. Maybe you give people a tax break if they own their own home because you believe that, you know, when more members of a community own their home, they take better care of the community and that helps, etc., etc. There's all sorts of examples. Okay, so let's look at it again. Here's a nice diagram right here. We've got our dead weight loss. Then we have the portion of the tax paid by consumers in the whole government revenue square, the top half of it. So notice this line is always going to, to connect to the original equilibrium. 
Okay, so you're going to do a horizontal line from the equilibrium, and then the quantity that actually gets produced is a vertical line, which is going to bisect those two. Okay, and that's going to give you the corners that you need. This triangle doesn't happen, so you can calculate that value, and you can obviously calculate these values. This right here, that's all government revenue. This is tax paid by consumers. This is tax paid by producers. Good stuff, gentlemen. That's all we got for Chapter 5.